I have the pleasure of moderating a panel of esteemed leaders and trailblazers in the Australian community who will provide us with their insights, experience and visions on the Islamic economy in Australia and the Muslim business community overall. Before we speak about the particular focus areas of the Islamic economy pertaining to Australia, based on your experience, how is the Islamic economy developing in Australia? And what are the trends that you have noticed locally and internationally as well? So I would like to pass that first question to uh, Zain. Um, it's a very good question. And it's a very big question. Um, and I think uh, the speakers that we've had earlier uh, today have shed some light on the answer to that, perhaps. I think uh, it's really important to bear in mind uh, where we are as an Australian Muslim uh, community as well. Um, so obviously, as Brother Talal uh, hinted to, we've probably got a community of around 800,000 to a million Muslims in Australia. The particular juncture we're at, uh, if we look at sort of historically, Muslim migration into Australia has sort of happened, I mean, from the Camellia times we were here, but bulk of the Muslim population has probably been here within the last 40 years. And what we're seeing at the moment is that, that there's a shift in generations. So we have a lot more prevalence of Australian-born Muslims. And what that means is culturally, people are growing up in two worlds. They're occupying the Australian world as people who are born in Australia, um, so consuming that culture and living that culture. At the same time, as uh, Professor Talal mentioned, Islam is very important to the Muslim community as a whole. And so those people also identify as Muslims. And that's an important aspect of their lives, how they earn their money, how they spend their money. So what we're dealing with here at this particular juncture is, uh, I think, a Muslim population that is highly educated in Australia, uh, relatively wealthy when we compare ourselves to other parts of the world, um, demanding, I would say, in terms of the quality of products and services that they expect, um, and also uh, seeking to contribute, I think, um, is, is another important aspect. So I think all of those things, uh, and I may be biased, uh, all of those ingredients come together to tell us that the entrepreneurial space where Muslims and, and Australians generally uh, creating new goods and services that will benefit the community and not just the Muslim community, but beyond the Muslim community, that is ripe for growth and development. And I think the only aspect that's perhaps missing in the puzzle is connection to venture capital. And that's something that we can explore as we go through the panel. But I think we're at a very exciting stage. And I think that the uh, State of the Global Islamic Economy report reflects that. And I think um, there's plenty of opportunity uh, that's highlighted in that report. Um, I saw you uh, nodding, Peter. Uh, would you like to articulate your nod? Um, what, what's your experience with the Islamic economy? Where are we heading? Mm -hmm. uh, how's the landscape looking like? Yeah, thanks, Nirvan. And Zain, I think, uh, shared uh, a great foundation. R really, it's a very promising and optimistic time, which is an unusual thing to say, you know, in 2020. Um, but I think in the, you know, the overall arc of, of uh, where things are going, the trajectory, looking at the report, looking at the data, but also just anecdotally meeting people, you know, meeting young founders in Indonesia, in Turkey, in Saudi, um, UAE, in the US, um, you know, connecting with these pockets of creative communities and at that grassroots level, this common thread is this connection to the faith, is this connection to, you know, this, we, I kind of think of it as like a heart-centered approach to entrepreneurship. And uh, this is quite, obviously, you know, this activity has been happening for some time, but there seems like there's more and more of more conversations, there's more support, and there's now an increasing awareness of the importance of capital in that, you know, in that ecosystem and um, success stories that are starting to come through. And it's wonderful that we have on the call people like uh, Rafi Udin, Dr. Said, um, Talal Yassin, who have really been pioneering for, for some years and, and now I think setting foundations for others, perhaps like my own team and, and others that are supporting these emerging entrepreneurs. I'd like to ask the panel overall, so whoever would like to answer can go for us. Is there something that you uh, have noticed that differentiates the Australian Islamic economy? Are there particular opportunities that we are more apt to seize upon in our context being, being in Australia? Perhaps um, for that particular question, uh, I feel for whatever reason I've had, a, in, in, you know, been, I guess, blessed with 
um, the drive to, to travel over the years and get to know other, you know, creative communities. That So in terms of thinking of the Australian Islamic economy, um, I think more broadly we're moving from a space where it was the, I kind of call the established Islamic economy, which is, you know, your food and your finance. And now looking forward, we're looking to um, fashion, we're looking to lifestyle, we're looking to digital products. And they can be really done from anywhere. It can be done from Australia. Uh, and that's literally what's happening. So um, in terms of the uniqueness of the Australian, what we bring, I think, um, of course, like every, you know, every particular place will bring its own set of approaches and a kind of cultural perspective that blends. And I think Australia is in a unique um, place to, if you, look, you know, our, our literally neighboring country um, right near us is Indonesia, the largest Muslim population in the world. And yet, you know, our background as a, as a nation is a bit Eurocentric. So, you know, bringing these blends now coming forward into the decades ahead um, is a really promising time. And I think it's in this year, last thing I'll say is um, what's shown is that uh, people are more comfortable, more open areas that maybe in like, for example, MENA region might have been a bit more reluctant to do business virtually, uh, at least in my own kind of observation, are very much used to doing uh, Zoom-based calls, doing digital um, interaction. E-commerce has um, gone up this year the same amount as the last seven years. So this mindset shifting, and that's a great thing for the Australian Islamic economy and entrepreneurial scene, because we now are operating pretty much at the same level of access as you know, a firm in Europe or a firm in the MENA region um, it won't replace that face-to-face, -face, but it definitely helps. And I've seen that in my own team. Uh, maybe we can uh, start with uh, Sister Zulfia. Um, working in the modest fashion industry itself, with your work that you've been doing with Mod Market, have you seen kind of observed some trends that, you know, the local experience is attracting a lot of international attention as well? There definitely has been a lot of attention from very big players in the market. So, you know, if you're talking about brands like, for example, Dolce & Gabbana, you know, giving modest fashion attention, creating specifically abeys and embellished headscarves. So that's kind of how things really started when really big brands started giving attention because before then, if you look about six, seven, eight years ago, it was a lot of smaller brands that were just frustrated women who couldn't find what they needed at catering and then they just wanted to cater for themselves and other women like that. So it began like that and then, you know, with the rise of modest fashion influencers, big brands got on board. Um, but what I see now sort of happening is that uh, a lot more brands have taken this on board and it's not just modest fashion brands, it's, a, it's global brands. Um, so you have, you know, even Australian brands like the Iconic but also ASOS internationally, Uniqlo. And so just so many brands are really starting to take modest fashion on board. So it's almost becoming um, just part of mainstream fashion in such a short time. And I think it's because people can see there's so much financial potential in it. But one thing that I have really noticed is brands are even doing, like if we're talking about grassroots and practical things, um, you know, even something as simple as searching. So when you want to search for something that you're looking for, it would have been very difficult to search and, and actually customise your search for something as simple as having long sleeves or, you know, a longer skirt, whereas now on nearly every single online store, there is that option where you can actually click for either modest or you can click for, you know, and customise your search for having something with long sleeves. So I think that, honestly, it's something that so many brands have taken on board and it, it's something for them that's obviously they get financial profit out of it, they get... Um, they get oh, this whole new clientele that they can serve and, and, and really just uh, grow their business. So I think it's just becoming a lot more mainstream now, which has its advantages and also challenges. Yeah, Definitely, definitely. Now, that's, uh, that's a great insight, obviously, seeing that parallel between uh, the local experience and the international experience. So obviously, our own community here in Australia is, is, uh, has certain demands that are also reflected across the world, which means that the products developed in Australia, uh, for the most part, uh, could be then translated into the global economy in itself. And uh, that also speaks to the diversity that we have in Australia within the Muslim community itself, coming from various different backgrounds. And uh, Kalisha, you, you have worked with uh, the Muslim com community quite closely. So uh, do you think uh, this diversity could be an advantage for us in, in the Islamic economy uh, being in Australia and kind of translating that internationally. What has your experience been uh, in, in that space? 
Uh, personally, I think what I've noticed within the community and the grassroots small business owners who I mostly work alongside and support uh, small business owners, women in business, young people wanting to start up businesses, um, because of the diversity of their backgrounds, they're also connected to their home countries as well or their family background, um, wherever they're from. And then they have access to, to be able to source stock for their products if they are doing a product or um, you know what we're also seeing is there is um, a lot of businesses which can also run online so again regardless of them being in Australia or abroad they can operate their businesses um, using online platforms uh, what I see is a, a lot of women in particular with product-based businesses to do with um, clothing there's a lot of health products homemade kind of things that they sell at markets or they have little Instagram pages where they sell. A lot of these small business owners also largely support each other. They do a lot of shout outs, a lot of um, buying from each other. Um, they run little market stalls and community markets. Um, so that's something which uh, it's, it's definitely a beautiful thing which you see being nurtured within the community. Um, probably what's lacking is the, the ability for businesses to grow beyond the startup phase. And myself, you know, I'm very much an, an emerging entrepreneur. I know I've run my business for three years after previously running my services for free on a volunteer basis for over 10 years in the Muslim community. So wow. deciding to become a paid professional was a big step in and of itself. And then getting the community mm -hmm. used to the concept of paying for my time and paying for my knowledge and, uh, and expertise, that has been a massive challenge as well. So um, we have now coming out of the COVID phase, uh, the 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 growth in online learning and myself as a, a coach and an online coach uh, I have the ability to teach online or, or in person um, the the value of coaching in terms of um, business and organizational growth you know research has shown that um, organizations and businesses with a coaching culture they show greater professional development and revenue growth it's definitely a growing industry there's a lot of Muslim coaches locally here and international coaches saying man the coaches in Australia, you guys are doing amazing work. And that might be a good segue into particular areas of the Islamic economy in Australia in itself. Australian Muslims have, have had an important footprint in the media and uh, recreation sector. Organisations such as the One Path Network, uh, Zillige and Gould Studio are notable examples for that. My question to, to the panel is, what are the developments you have been able to observe in this sector and what opportunities are there for Australian Muslim businesses? That might be a good question for Peter to address. Sure. Yeah, and no, I think you touched on uh, some great insights and observations, which I think the report does um, share really well. And, you know, I just do want to give that uh, recommendation for everyone to, to take a look and download that report from Salam Gateway because a lot of work goes into... Um, that research and it's now I think in its uh, seventh year if I remember Rafi will pull me up on that if it's not uh, but those reports are um, there's you know they share the data and they share but also there's these beautiful insights from this emerging generation so um, it's a great resource a great reference and throughout the year you see a lot of people refer to that so um, but I will share that um, it is again this unique time where um, because we're, the digital ecosystem is just so interconnected that, for example, you find kids, you know, many of us parents here will, of course, be watching, you know, shows, Netflix or YouTube, you know, from, an, you know, from whatever source uh, it streams, Disney Plus, it's regardless. What's fascinating to me is seeing then, for example, in Australia, kids watching Omar and Hannah, Didi and Friends, Nusa, uh, and of course, for, um, for um, many parents, or maybe some younger ones, Ertugul, Darilis Ertugul, as an example, as a global Muslim phenomena, really, which had over 1 billion views in Ramadan alone, shows you the strength and um, the, from a media and recreation point of view, uh, which I think is actually highlighted in the port really well, um, what is that pull? That's a tremendous pull uh, to, of, of you know, thirst for content. And if you combine that with this digital age of the streaming subscription mindset, where you have in Australia, for example, Stan, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, Netflix, um, and another of others now streaming. Um, and then you have emerging platforms like Alchemia uh, or Muslim Kids TV. You have this desperate thirst for content. 
and the parents, you know, many of those who had lockdown kids this year needing more and more content, more content. And then you've had these content creators and creatives and design teams and media teams, you know, eager to get funding to pull. So if you think about it, it's that all the ingredients are there. And I, I personally hope and I believe that we'll see over the next 24, uh, 48 months, a lot more investment and success stories emerging where you have, you know, this kind of Muslim friendly or more wholesome kids media and digital media starting to come through. Uh, we had a bit of success, alhamdulillah, with our own attempts at that through Five Pillars and Salam Sisters. And uh, we hope that there'll be many more of these kind of stories where you get this combination of beautifully well-designed, thoughtful, user-centric, human-centered designed consumer products, and media and recreation. And hey, that could be done from Sydney or Melbourne or Perth. Uh, and it can be watched by someone in Jakarta or, you know, Johannesburg or, you know, Istanbul like, or Jeddah. Um, that's, this, that's Islamic economy to me, you know, because of the shared values, there's this shared alignment. And hey, I also think it's a great way to introduce other people curious into certain um, aspects. We have a window perhaps into our heart-centered approach, some of the things that Muslims hold dear, packaged in a way that's, yeah, compelling, visually beautiful, exciting. That's also a great opportunity. So, you know, it's a it's a great alignment if we can get it right, inshallah. If I might, if I might add to that as well, I think uh, Peter's touched on some really good points. And if you think about the the sort of blurring of lines between the, we don't want to call it the two economies, but if we distinguish between, say, the global economy generally and the global Islamic economy, a lot of Muslims consume Netflix, right? And so there's no reason why it can't go the other way. And I think that opportunity is really, really remarkable um, and, and, and a really big one. So there's no reason why uh, content that is created perhaps with a Muslim angle or a Muslim lens or for a Muslim audience perhaps, uh, why that can't be appealing to the global population more broadly. And I think we see that in many other industries. So we see that with uh, halal food, for example, with tayeb food or other concepts of organic food um, more broadly, and, and even with fashion, as, as Sister Zulfia sort of indicated, that these things have become mainstream. And I think that is where it can be difficult to sometimes capture from a data perspective because there's that blurring of lines. It's not crystal clear. But that just speaks to the size of the opportunity. It really is uh, bigger than perhaps we, you know, we may think. Um, and, and as uh, the panelists and speakers have spoken about earlier, the trends have surprised us. Uh, and so that, that's an exciting uh, thought. And also, if I could add to what you were saying, both Peter and Zane, um, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see that it is becoming mainstream and that so many people are jumping on board and there is that potential influence that we can have. And, at, you know, by the same token, it's so important to also realise that um, because the, the intention is to serve the Muslim community, it's so important to support the actual like grassroots people and the, and the Muslim people who are trying to make that happen because there are people who, who may have better finances or who may have, you know, better networks who actually go, go ahead and create those things um, and, and serve our community, whereas there are people who really could do so much and who, who are Muslim and who, whereas they, they might not have the resources. So I, I'm just really glad, like, that you know, with Mecca Collective to hear the work that you guys are doing and, and other organisations who are doing similar things because um, we really need to support the, you know, just like even the people Kalisha was talking about, like those grassroots people who may not have those resources but who want to make, you know, amazing, like, TV shows for children who but just don't have the um, resources. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a key message to take away from our conversation as well, which is support Muslim businesses. I mean, um, for us to develop products in, in a way that is representative of our community and something that we're proud of, like Crescent Well, for example, these, these businesses need to be supported and we need to stand behind them and obviously tolerate sometimes that there will be hiccups. And Nirvana, I was just going to share, uh, not meant to be a shout out that, that was planned, but just came to me when you mentioned the question, if I'm not mistaken, um, Crescent helped support recently The Furnace. I haven't seen it, but by all accounts, uh, a beautifully uh, produced film that's very important. And if I am guessing, it looks like a fantastic way of the ecosystem supporting and many people benefiting. Uh, I don't know, Tala, I know you're not on the panel, but of course you're on the panel. <laughs> that was a good example, I think, uh, of you know media working with the ecosystem to support everyone. 
So. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Peter. I think uh, the furnace is a uh, a not a Hollywood A class uh, movie yet, but it will be iconic in terms of Australia uh, because I think it represents in Muslim history 150 years ago and beyond, and very much like our global panelists would understand the Wild Wild West and how the West was won in the American story, or this was our Wild Wild West. And Muslim Kamalis from Afghanistan, from, um, I guess, uh, the whole re- Pakistan, the whole region and their Sikh counterparts really helped discover Australia. And we at Crescent Wealth thought it was a really important story to be told. What it has to do with global pension products is absolutely zero. But it talks <laughs> to our, uh, our, uh, who we are, what we stand for and the broader dawah. A different way of putting it is about building our ecosystems. And I'm really, really proud to see sisters uh, in small and larger businesses having a shot and uh, being entrepreneurial. And we we take it as a matter of privilege and pride to support anybody who gives it a shot from our community. From that end of town, I also thought, Kalisha, I've seen firsthand, you know, grassroots, uh, you know, tra- transforming Perth and creating this beautiful legacy there, but also, mashallah, now in Sydney, uh, this, you know, on the ground, emerging leaders, young people, especially women, and uh, and she's a very humble person, so she probably won't share, but, you know, I've seen firsthand those stories and how that is really empowering um, the entrepreneurial spirit, that confidence. Anyway, Kalisha, I'll let you share, but um, I just, I wanted to make sure you, it wasn't just Talal who got the shout out. I think you deserve it as well, mashallah. <laughs> Peter for the shout out and throwing me under the bus awkwardly. (laughs) Um, I guess for me, uh, you know, working with the community, that's uh, my heartbeat really, you know, that's my, um, the the drive for me personally, you know, my my life's purpose and my life's mission. But, um, you know, early on, uh, maybe five to, you know, between five to eight years ago, I started learning about the concept of, um, you know, being able to earn an income through the time that you give and through the teaching and the volunteering and the creation of community projects and um, I had to think about okay you know number one taking the work um, seriously in terms of valuing myself and my time and expertise and then how do I feel about charging the community for and how will the community respond to that so I think that's something that's interesting and it is definitely evolving seeing the way our community value different things and uh, you know I, I joke about the term free sabilillah because that used to be a very common term requested free please sister free or or a sister goes to another sister's business gets her hair cut or something at a muslim hairdresser and then requests a 50 dollars discount but if they went to somewhere else they would never dare do such a thing and what i'm noticing is that there is a shift in that there is greater valuing of people's time of people's efforts and energies and um yeah i think uh looking at you know the work and the projects that i've been doing and thinking about how do i turn this business into a profitable business, you know, and what does that look like for me who's a very grassroots person? I'm not um, highly educated. I'm not a corporate woman, uh, you know, as such, but I can do a lot of things. I have a lot of skills, skill sets, and I have, um, you know, I have, I've, I have a lot of different abilities and ability to grow and adapt. So again, even the self-learning journey of businesses, business people and entrepreneurs who is going to kind of take us under their wing and mentor us and um, literally invest in us, you know, in terms of, uh, yes, potentially finances being invested in as as small businesses and believed in, but also invested in terms of training and teaching small uh, business people, young people, women, how to get bigger and how to grow um, rather than chasing the tailcoats of big corporations and the big guns that we might see around us, you know, in our in our cities, in our countries internationally, how about we look down uh, to those who could uh, use a helping hand and let us all grow together? Um, I think that's something um, that we could really improve on and work on. As much as we want to chase and race forward, um, we mustn't forget, you know, the person next door. And uh, we know that this is an Islamic teaching, Islamic principle too, that there is no true like competition in business. Um, There's enough to go around. Allah is rich. Al-Ghani, Allah is the provider. He has enough to give all of us equally. So, you know, we should um, really lend that helping hand. And, you know, Peter's really modeling that with how he's been able to support uh, me and other members of the, the business community. On that note, I think it's good to hone in a little bit on this particular issue, which is uh, women entrepreneurs. 
And as an entrepreneur yourself, what are the developments and trends you've been able to observe in in the space of women entrepreneurship in the Australian Muslim community? And what are some of the unique challenges and the unique opportunities for Muslim women at this point in time? When it comes to what's, you know, what's trending amongst Muslim women in business here within Australia, we do have, uh, you know, the a smaller amount of women who really have the know-how. They've, they've perhaps studied business or they've grown up or had a mentor around them who's been able to coach or support them or maybe their spouse um, is business-minded and they've been able to build uh, really strong businesses. And then you've got the grassroots women who are working from home, their mothers, there's a lot of them too, mashallah, and they're really focused on the wholesome things, you know, food businesses, cupcake businesses, soaps, health products, uh, personal care products, but they're also focused on benefit and contribution is a big part of, of, of what they do. And Subhanallah, you you see that you know they're earning very little, but they're giving a lot of it back straight back to the community. Um, and you know this really we have to realize that this is bringing the baraka uh, within our community. Why give Johnsons and Johnsons your you know twenty dollars a week on personal care products when that twenty dollars could benefit a sister and her family or a single mum who's struggling? And um, you know it's it's very important that us as a Muslim community as well um, really look towards where we can uh, you know you know, put our, put our dollar into where is most blessed and where is going to bring most benefit to ourselves and to our community. Um, again, yeah. the challenges, what are the challenges uh, for a lot of small businesses? The startup dollars, you know. I remember I, I think I had a couple of hundred dollars in the bank when I started mine, um, paying a designer to design my logo. Um, my coach, you know, my business coach, personal development coach had to give me like a discount because, you know, he really wanted me to start my business and actually forced me to um, and said, you need to do this. It's time, you know. Um, uh, and then again, when businesses get to a certain level, how do they grow to the next level of being um, supported in that regard as well? We don't, um, alhamdulillah, there are some, uh, you know, government supported, like you can go to your local council and get free business advisory in some councils. Um, like, for example, in my locality, you can get $400 of business advisory for, you know, for free. In our own Muslim community, alhamdulillah, we have, you know, things like Startup or Mine. We have Mecca Collective and these things which are emerging, which is excellent. We have also the, the Muslim Women's Business Club by Sister Saret Hussein. Um, we have these these little hubs which are developing, which I think are really important because, uh, as most people know, the entrepreneurial journey is a very lonely one. Uh, when people have big visions, big dreams, uh, you're often, um, a lot of people uh, close to you and around you don't quite understand where your head's at and what, what you're envisioning. Uh, so to be able to find like-minded people, it's uh, a very powerful thing. Uh, a lot of head nodding because I could understand and personally relate to every single thing you spoke about, Kalisha. Um, even the even how you're talking about going to the local council and trying to find a mentor that way because I've been there and done that. So um, two things. The first thing is working... Um, as a female in business, especially in the fashion industry, modest fashion industry, a lot of the people I deal with are women. So the um, what's great about that is there's that flexibility and the understanding of being able to actually have your business hours from 8 p.m. until midnight. That's when all the business calls are happening. During the daytime, It's that's, that's when people are busy with their families, busy with their children. So I think working, um, having that sisterhood and that understanding and, and just being able to support each other that way. Or, you know, when you can bring your children to meetings, you can, you can have a, a crying child. All of these things may sound very unprofessional, but if you factor women into the business force in their entirety and not as just you know, just their professional, but if you, if you take women as a whole, that's what women come with because we're the ones who birth the children. So you'll have a breastfeeding mum and you can have that business meeting. So I think that's one of the strengths of having um, women support each other in business. One of the challenges that I've faced uh, and that I've heard other women have experienced is um, because a lot of people uh, who are established in the industry or who've had a lot of time to really establish themselves are males, it's very, very difficult to actually get into a network because the, the, it seems like there's already a lot of clicks and networks. And I found that um, just really being able to be taken seriously or be uh, mentored or actually be able to um, get involved with a network, I found it was very difficult. And so um, I found myself knocking on many doors and being rejected many times, which is part of business. Um, and it makes you more resilient. But I do feel like um, 
uh, with the, with the males, just even within the Muslim community, it's very important to um, to make sure that you're always looking to see which women are there that you know are, are doing something that you can actually not just financially. It's more introducing you know, um, just basically using your networks, I think as a business person to support other business people is really important, especially if you're already established more so than other people. Um, yeah, that, so that's something that I've experienced. Um, the, the sisters make a really, really good point. And uh, I uh, am an entrepreneur as well, a few years older, just a few, uh, but the burn is real. It's exactly the same when I told people I want to start a pension fund for for Muslims and people thought you were crazy. I didn't quite go to the council. I spoke to the mayor. He couldn't help me. But, <laughs> but the point is uh, today in Australia uh, we have institutions and it seems to me you guys are dying, uh, calling out for uh, something like the Crescent Institute where we have a mentoring program where there are people who are uh, your age and slightly older and uh, approaching kind of my age uh, and a lot of them are women and we're about connecting them so feel free to reach out especially for entrepreneurs um, because you can you can hang around other fellow entrepreneurs which is great because you live the pain together and uh, I guess from my point of view you know problems shared are problems spared but you need the helping hand of someone who can probably provide some finance or somewhere to go or to do something and there's a network around the country with the Crescent Institute that I can recommend. Just to take a more uh, macro perspective again, one final question I would like to ask is, what would you like to see take place in the Muslim business uh, community at this point in time? And where do you think we are headed? What's the future looking like? Um, yeah, uh, look, it's a really interesting question. I don't have the, the crystal ball, so to speak. But I think, um, I mean, the report is really, really insightful in terms of providing what it, what we consider to be a pathway over the next few years. It's clear that the Islamic global Islamic economy is resilient and it sounds like it's going to bounce back within a pretty relatively short period of time. I think one of the interesting things that we'll see is the emergence of new brands, new new businesses. I think that's something that's really probably part of a more global trend around the pandemic itself. So, you know, people are, as we've all experienced, you know, living at home, working from home, changing the way we do things, changing our behaviours, wearing masks, et cetera. What that does is I think it has the impact of really shaking up the way people see how things should work and how things can work. And I think that that uh, opens up the opportunity for new businesses to emerge, new products to emerge, um, customer-centric products to emerge, I think, and that's a trend that I think will really be prominent over the next 5, 10 and beyond years. Um, you know, the focus on what is it that the customer really wants and addressing those pain points and addressing those uh, hopes and dreams, I suppose, of, of customers rather than being uh, product focused or competitor focused. Um, so those things I think will emerge. I think the opportunities within the, the, the markets are huge. So, you know, we've spoken about the Islamic finance opportunity and the and the halal food opportunity, but beyond that, there's so much opportunity within Islamic travel. Um, you know, uh, Professor Talal was talking about how many people actually travel in, and and Dr. Said brought it up as well. How many people travel into Australia? Um, Muslim people that travel into Australia. So there's a lot of opportunity there, and I think the the um, things that will emerge are new brands will emerge. Uh, inshallah, you know, we'll create great Muslim brands that serve beyond the Muslim community. And I'd, I'd really love to see that, inshallah.